All right. Welcome, everybody, to another Zebra Central Image Breakdown stream. We've got a, another special guest. This is episode three. We got Alexander Lee with us today. Alex, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the stream. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. For those that maybe are not familiar with Alex's work, uh, he uses ZBrush to do a lot we call claymations or like an animation using ZBrush. It's very cool. It's something very unique. And you guys are really sit back. You're going to enjoy this a lot. Um, you know, but before we even get into, I want to make sure if you're just joining us for the first time for streams like this, we're looking to do this um, every week, pretty much now we're booking these. So we're going to be sitting with artists like Alex and they're going to be breaking down their work and how they're using ZBrush to do some of the work. So really quick, I just want you all to be aware there is a calendar. So you can see Alex streams right here in the calendar. I'll share this in the chat with you all. So you have this um, for you to save bookmark if you want to. Um, so I just want to make sure you're all aware of that uh, before we get diving into with Alex. And it's important for all you guys because there are streams happening every single week. Um, so in fact, next week, we've got three streams alone next week. Uh, next week at eight in the morning, there's a Maxon company stream. So you might want to check that out. That's uh, April 20th, next Wednesday. And then the same day, we're doing another stream at 11. Uh, so we're going to be involved in that. So this is why I wanted to share the calendar with you all. And then the next day, which is next Thursday, we actually going to have the makers of Huxley um, doing a stream with us, which is going to be really awesome. And they're going to be sharing all their techniques and how they've been using ZBrush to create the, uh, the film that they're working on, right? So enough enough about me. So I just want you all to have that and make sure you're aware of that calendar. Cause like I said, these are streams we're, we're putting together and thanks Alex for your time today and being with us. I'm excited yeah, totally. for you to share your technique and see what you've been doing. Uh, I think yeah. I'm gonna get a really good kick out of this. So if you're ready, I'll, I'll share your screen now and then uh, yeah, totally. from there. Um, we will be looking at questions as we come along. So if you guys have questions for Alex as we're going through here, put them in the chat. I'll do my best to send as many as I can to him. But he's got a lot of stuff he, he wants to cover, too. So we want to make sure I want to make sure we get through everything that he wants to cover. So, Alex, I'll let you take it from here now. All right. So I'll start uh, just playing through these. Um, so basically, I've been working um, in games for about nine years. Um, I've worked as kind of like a sculptor, as an animator, as a tech artist. Um, and I, I actually originally got into it through animation. Um, as a kid, I did a lot of stop motion with Lego. And um, from there, I kind of branched into CG. Um, but I always kind of enjoyed that stop motion feel. And um, when I started working in CG, I... Um, I got really interested in human anatomy and figure sculpture and I took Scott Eaton's courses um, and he kind of emphasizes having like a really fluid dynamic look to the sculptures and um, I really got into doing kind of like um, dynamesh sculpts of figures without symmetry in ZBrush. And I like you know like kind of the the dynamic um, feel you can get to it um, but I noticed that like when I would then put it in a T pose, you know, build the rig, do all the animation process, do like weight painting and skinning. Once I got to animation, like I lost a lot of the kind of like life in the sculpture, I felt like um, that I got just in straight ZBrush um, working without symmetry. So, so back in 2018, I had this idea like, what if I um, use sub tools in ZBrush as animation frames um and that way i can sculpt on every frame and um kind of get like artistic control over every single frame that way and not rely on you know pure, purely a rig to um get the motion and so i started doing experiments with that um there are ways to do it strictly in zbrush and then there i also have some scripts that i made to um take animation from other applications like maya bring it into ZBrush and then sculpt over all the frames. So that's what I would do on most of these. Um, just bring them in and essentially get things like, you can see smears, which are basically like sculpted motion blur. Um, you can get parts of the mesh like kind of tearing off 
using um, Dynamesh and Sculptors Pro. And um, yeah, just kind of, you know, making it look exactly how I want on every frame. So that's the basic idea um, with this. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, it definitely has that claymation feel, stop motion kind of feel to it too. You're definitely landing that. That's pretty awesome. You can see more of these um, in the ZBrush viewport here. Um, and you can even get things like, like here, there's um, fluid simulation almost, but it's just all sculpted. I always liked, um, like with hand-drawn animation, they had some crazy hand-drawn, you know, like um, fluid effects sometimes. Yeah. And I feel like you can kind of get this in 3D using this technique as well. Yeah, you're almost like using the subtools as in animation, the onion that they, you know, you're doing in animation. Yeah. Like being the five or six frames ahead and four or five frames behind. Like you're doing that, but you're doing it with subtools and geometry instead. Yeah, and you can actually use um, like ghosting on the subtools to kind of get yeah. an onion skinning effect like that. Yeah. It's awesome. It's got a beautiful uh look to it and feel right so thank you it's really cool this is why we i was excited to have you as a guest so it's something unique and different too that's being done with zbrush so it's it's awesome to see this you can see in a case like this um since it's all dynamesh i kind of like separate the part that's moving from the rest of the scene so i can keep the resolution manageable um this guy's sitting in a chair and i just had like the the arms of the chair attached to his hands because those are the part where he actually interacts. Um, and then I pop those back into the scene. So, so yeah, like that, that's the primary challenge with this is um, since every frame is a sculpture, you know, you have to make sure the resolution doesn't get out of control. Um, normally I aim around like maybe 50 million for the entire animation and that works really well. Um, but it's, it's nice with tools like um, Sculptors Pro a lot of times. I can like decimate areas that are not the main focus or um, things that are moving faster and kind of keep the polygon count down that way. Yeah, and it looks like the benefit too, you're being you're doing a lot of different camera angles. How many how much of that do you find yourself doing? Like changing the camera angle, looking um, you... Yeah, that's a good question because a lot of times with animation you want to animate to a shot cam. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's what I typically do, like if I'm gonna render it out. Um, I'll just fix the camera and I'll send it to ZBrush as part of the FBX. Um, and then just try to animate to that camera in ZBrush as well. But in this case, like this one, um, I wanted it to be played back in real time where you can actually just look at it from any angle. And, um, if you want, if you want it to be visible from any perspective, you know, it just ends up being a lot more work because you can't cheat to camera as much, right. um, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, it's always good to focus on one camera uh, usually. Like if you looked at this animation, um, <laughs> if you looked at it from a different angle, it would be all broken. That's very cool stuff. So you're going to show us some of the techniques yeah. that you do to make all this happen. So this will be really great to see for everybody. Those are awesome. Yeah, and those are available on your uh, Zebra Central post as well. I'll get that and you guys can see it too. So if you want to go back and and communicate with Alex to some more and see those videos some more. I'll share uh, the link in the chat. Yeah, so um, first I was just going to quickly show that first animation here in ZBrush. Um, typically, I keep the camera locked on the Y just to keep things kind of um, manageable so I know what the camera is going to be seeing. And um, yeah, so basically, I'm using the sub tools as frames. So to go forward through the animation, I'm going down and back and going up. And I just put a um, shortcut on those. I put the A key for up and D key for down. And then I can just step through the animation, um, just flipping through frames that way. And you can even just hold the button, which is really nice. You can play through it um, by just holding it down, which like, I feel like that was just so lucky that this happened to be built that way, <laughs> that it works perfectly for animation in that way. Um, so you can see here, like, where I'm lowering the resolution when things get faster. And I'll show that in the demo as well, um, just using Sculptor Pro kind of to um, decimate things. 
and um, stretching things out as it moves um, and merging objects is the other big thing with this technique. So like I had these, obviously the, the hands, the head and the this frame here were all separate objects coming out of the animation, but then I just dynamish them together here. Um, so I'm gonna do a quick demo of uh, just doing an animation directly in ZBrush. I see you made your own custom menu too. To yeah. This. I guess this is poly, it's poly paint on, I'm not sure. There. So I'm just going to dynamesh this um, pretty low resolution. Just make like a quick swirling animation. So I'm just going to rename the first sub tool to um, 01, and then it'll just number them as I duplicate. Um, let's see, probably turn on Sculptors Pro actually. Get a pretty low resolution blob. So you're you're adjusting your settings. You put what did you you turn down subdiv and then you turned up. The so adapter. I put oh uh, yeah undivide ratio just at one so it's basically the same. Um, it has the same you know resolution as the subdivide. Um, it's just unified that way, and then. I turned up the subdivide size pretty high so that um, this will be a low resolution. So I turn that down, then it'll be have more polygons. Um, and then I always use the adaptive size so I can change the brush and make it bigger. Resolution will be lower. Yeah, make it smaller. Like that. Um, so that's the first frame. So that's good as the first frame. And I'll just duplicate. I put a hotkey on that, Control D. Um, you can put whatever you want. I think it's Control Shift D by default. Um, so I just duplicate that frame. I'm in solo mode, and then basically the main tools I use for almost everything are Snake Hook and Inflate. Um, I find that almost every sculpting job can be done with those. Um, maybe Standard Brush as well sometimes. So. I just get a first frame there, just stretching it out. Um, another frame, just a duplicate sub tool. Stretch it out a little bit more. And I'm, I'm thinking about volume preservation. So if this is like a sphere of this size, it starts coming up, it's going to start stretching out and getting, um, you know, a little skinnier. As it gets longer. Yeah, and you're using he's using his shortcuts to actually cycle through the subtools right now. So yeah, sorry. Speed. Yeah. So I'm using the A and D keys to go up and down. It's the same as pressing these up and down. Yeah. By default, those are uh shortcuts are up arrow and down arrow on your keyboard if you're looking at the default settings. So, so that's probably good as a third. Another one. And as it with animation, you want to think about um, spacing in terms of the speed of how fast something is moving. So this frame is pretty close to this one because it's moving relatively slowly right now. As it's going to start going faster, I want to start stretching them out farther apart. So this one currently um, needs to be probably farther along. Bring up. Oh, so you're using the bigger the volume then in your animation it's going to play faster at that point right because it's a bigger yeah step, so then it'll be a bigger animation play because it's a larger change yeah and it's farther from the previous from scope the previous. as well right and also i'm low, lowering the resolution because um when things start moving really fast you don't really see details in them and um they tend to have like really clean curves that they have through space once they start going faster. And you can really control that nicely if you lower the resolution. Do you go back and um, like change the resolution of certain models you find sometimes? Like that one's got really polygoned uh, mm -hmm. triangulation. Do you go back and smooth it out and make it be a little bit smoother? Yeah. If I, um, depending on what I want to do with it, yeah, I could certainly. Um, go back and use like, you know, finer brush with this and put it right. back. But it actually tends to look nicer, I find a lot of times if I leave it super low resolution. Um, 
because it's just a flash. Like I'm going typically 15 frame per, frames per second. Um, and you don't actually see the polygons. You just see kind of like a rough, nice, like smear frame. Right. Um, yeah, that's a good point to make out. So, so yeah, it looks like I'm getting a little bit off the arc. I want to always think about how this is curving together. And one thing I can do is turn off solo and just see those all together and still step through those and make sure that they're all following the same basic curve. Also turn on transparent if you want. Ghost. I find transparent is usually best for this. Um, so let's go back to solo. Probably just still needs to go farther. And then I'll make another one. Um, really want to stretch it out at this point. Something that's really um, good to do is adjusting the focal shift on snake hook. You can do so much with that. Like if I want to get um, broad movement, I might have a pretty big focal shift. But if I want to get like a, a curve in this, I just um, focus that down. And then you can completely control that curve and has a nice fall off. Um, so that's, that's super useful. And you can do all this with um, Dynamesh as well, can, changing the resolution, but um, Sculptors Pro really makes it a lot easier. I'm gonna check again if this is preserving volume. Um, like it probably needs to get a little smaller here. I'll duplicate that again. Um, and then as you're working, are you usually working from the front ortho or you're moving around a lot? In this case, I'm just going to um just animate from the front ortho just for this demo um but yeah like so usually for a full animation i would be trying to mostly match the camera that i animated from in maya um and just kind of um cheat to that camera as much as possible but if i'm doing something for real time um then yeah i'd be orbiting around and if i I've been doing it just from the front, but if I basically stick to one camera, it tends to stay pretty consistent. It's not going too crazy. Um, and I would just have to make some adjustments if I want to see this from other angles. Um, so this is getting a little in there and I need to fix the curve. So I'm just inflating it. And just use snake hook to adjust that. And um, Sculptors Pro is really nice for um, basically like erasing. So I can either just erase off the end here um, by using the smooth tool, or I can also break a hole like in the mesh. I like to tear off parts with it. So I go like right here, um, probably increase the subdivide size. Snap that off. Sometimes I like to have stuff um, tear off during the animation. It makes that probably that dripping look that you were getting in a lot of mm -hmm. yours. So Do you always use this material um, and or do you have any specific lighting or anything that you do? Is just pretty much this material. This is um, this is a material I downloaded called Maya Blin, and I'm not sure where I got it. Um, someone named GW apparently, <laughs> but I like to use a lot of different ones. Um, it's pretty similar to Matcap Gray, which also works well for this. I think that might have been might have been on the Matcap library 
That's probably why it's GW is okay. the artist's name that made it. Oh, okay. Yeah, their, probably. Their initials. It might be. I'd have to go double check. That might be where you got it. Also, um, I could show later that I also animate polypaint while I'm sculpting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I have some specific materials for that as well, um, where they basically, you know, are mostly just white. And then the poly paint comes through better that way um, in ZBrush. So I got to see. I don't think it's moving fast enough still here. Um, I'm stretching out more. Duplicate that again. Just delete this part with the smoothing. Uh, warped. Check how much time we have. No, you're good. Uh, you're you're early only uh, twenty minutes in. The world clock on my computer is messed up. I'm like, wait a minute, it's not noon. Because <laughs> my my computer's world clock says it's noon. I'm like, we started at noon. What's going on? I was wondering what that that ominous clock was behind your head. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's for when we're doing the sculpt off and everything. Like, okay, oh, I'm just never <laughs> taking it. Intimidating. <laughs> Take it off the wall. Zero time left. <laughs> um, Dice K found the uh, shader. He just put it. So it looked like uh, I was 3D total. He found it. Oh, okay. Pretty total still around. I don't. I don't know. I haven't been there in a while. I feel like the uh, COVID's also given me a blimp on everything that goes on in the world now. <laughs> I feel like we actually did live the Avengers movie. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't looked in a while. It must be because he's going there. Yeah, he's got the link to there. Oh wow. Okay. Um, what do you think? How much time do you think you work on these projects when you're doing these? Like, how much do you think time you're putting into one piece? Um, so it varies a lot. Like, you could finish a simple loop like this in 20 minutes. Um, there have been pieces I've done coming out of Maya um, um, into ZBrush and then back to Maya to render in only two hours. That's like with a full figure. Oh, wow. But um, those are short, you know, like, only be like five seconds maybe at most um what do you tend seconds. to shoot for for all yours what how much time do you usually do you set out for for the the duration yeah. of the animation yeah do you have a time um, yeah i mean i like to do around 10 seconds oftentimes but i have done some that are longer it definitely takes like exponentially longer it feels like um exponentially more work the longer the animation is yeah you really are doing like stop motion for the most part here, like just set the using different sub tools is a unique, great way of doing that. Uh, that's a great example of using transparency to line stuff up. Yeah, because I, I felt like it was kind of um, offset, but I couldn't tell for sure. Um, so in order to feel fluid, it's got to follow basically exactly the curve from the previous frame. So question came in, what's the hardest part about this type of animation for you? Um, I think the hardest part of animation for me always is just deciding what to animate. Um, kind of like what the character is going to do, like what his story is, like how, how does the, the motion reflect his character, um, like what he wants to accomplish or whatever, and his personality and stuff. Those are, I feel like, the hardest things with animation. Um, and even with just an experimental test, like coming up with like what would look cool, um, is always the hardest. Um, beyond that, I, I feel like um, whenever I'm animating in the ZBrush stage, I really just enjoy it, um, kind of just get into it. And um, typically, when I'm at that stage, like I'm not having to think about the concept as much and just enjoying like the flow of animation so I can listen to music and um, uh, zone out a little bit. Yeah, you get in the groove. So this is getting pretty close to, to um, lining up now. Just making a kind of a bolt on the end to go back to that ball shape. I'm going to um, 
instead of using these to step through, I'm going to switch to a script that I have, um, a Z script, just for um, basically does the same thing, stepping through the subtools, but it has a loop added. So when it gets to the last one, it switches to the first. Yeah. That way I can start working on that final frame. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you're going through them and it's jumping back to the first in the script, it looks like, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that was just a simple Z script. It's getting a little I'd say for the most part, your your polygon counts on any of the subtools isn't getting too high, right? The question was how you optimize your scene because you're working on characters. A lot of subtools increase your polygon count into the millions. But it looks like most of your single meshes aren't getting too dense, right? Yeah, in this case, I'm keeping it super low. It's like I have 5,000 total. Um, this is just, you know, this is a simple shape. For a, typically things like fingers are where you need the most resolution so they don't start like sticking together. Yeah. Um, and it just depends on like how long the shot is. Um, typically, you know, I'd have all of the sub tools for one shot together in one scene. Um, and I just, I shoot for like not more than 50 million in ZBrush at a time, all sub tools together. Across all sub tools, yeah. Yeah, so I just do um, 50 million divided by the number of sub tools and that gives me a target kind of to aim for, for how much uh, each sub tool should have. Um, and it really depends on like where it is in the animation. Um, it's yeah, it's moving. actually what you're doing is actually a good workflow. Having separate subtools it doesn't hurt. It's actually better for ZBrush even to yeah. try and do 50 million in one mesh compared to 50 million across 200 meshes. That's actually even better. You're going to get even better right. performance um, than trying to do 50 million on 50 million and 50 million and 50 million and 50 million multiple subtools. It's actually good to have the subtools. It's not going to harm your Yeah, exactly. Actually. Yeah, and the, the main concern then is just... Um, getting like fast playback, like when I'm switching through them. And that's really the only limitation. Like I could go, you know, way beyond 50 million if I wanted to. Um, yeah. It just might be a little slower stepping through them. Um, so yeah, this is looking pretty close. If I play it back, I just hold it down. It's a pretty decent loop. Um, I think this one is looking a little square, this first one. And then you for your final part, you were running some of the, rendering those in ZBrush and then you also export some, right? So you do a combination of rendering some in ZBrush and rendering some in Maya. Yeah, so um, typically I, I just record directly from the viewport in ZBrush. I don't um, really render them out if, if I'm doing it that way, but if I'm doing it in Maya, um, I just have a script to, well, basically I ex export all of these together as an FBX. Mm -hmm. And when they get into my other, um, all separate objects. And then I have a script to go through those and um, set them up for rendering. Yeah, so he's using an FBX to export all the meshes out of ZBrush, plop it into Maya, and he's got a script in Maya he uses if he's gonna render in Maya. That, that's pretty good now. Um, probably would to linger here a little bit, right? Duplicate that and then just bring it down to the bottom. Um, so it will, I'm just adding extra frames essentially so that it'll be slower. Um, more frames, the uh, slower the motion. Um, So, yeah, adding some fillers in there. Yeah, a couple other subtools. This is like Pretty look into my eyes. You want to be part of it? <laughs> yeah, you could use this as like the, um, you know, the loading like little icon or the save. Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah, that would actually that's a pretty cool idea. Making your own like loading icon like that would be pretty cool. And like you said, you colorize that. You can even swap out the materials too because they're subtools. Yeah, actually, I can show really quickly um, before we move on to the other one, um, the other animation. 
I could show really quickly how I would start painting this. And this is saved. So um, I think there's a way to, if I hold shift, I can, yeah, okay. If I hold shift and click on the paintbrush, it'll colorize all of them. Um, and then I can start putting poly paint. And I think I'm just going to leave. Sometimes I poly paint with Sculptress Pro on, depending on the situation. Um, yeah, because it's going to tessellate with the paint as well. It's not just yeah, a sculpting thing. Yeah. It's a, also painting. We'll, we'll have tessellation happening when you paint as well. Since this is the first frame, I'll probably tessellate it because I don't want it to look too polygonal. It's not moving very fast at this point. Oh, yeah, you can call you change the colors based upon the speed, too. Yeah. Yeah, your mind just starts racing. You're like, oh, what can I do with this? Yeah. I'm just going to share your uh, ZBrush Central post again with everybody in the chat. They're enjoying what you're doing. Yeah, I'm just going to make it like colored some um, slow and kind of lose its color. It's going faster. It's kind of the idea for now. Turn that off. So keep the lower resolution. Yeah, you know, keep your polygon count as is and then paint just mm -hmm. based on that. I lock my camera. So when I'm painting like this, it's probably best to lock the camera. I think um, it's in draw. Yep. Here, yeah. So that way I can't can't navigate. There's just a lot of overdraw with something like this. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're working <laughs> fast too, right? And you're yeah, just getting in, like you said, in a rhythm. And it's starting to slow down here and return to the shape. So I'm just gonna make it more colored. Someone is asking, do you do you teach anywhere? Do you teach any courses anywhere? Um, yeah, I, I did a um, I did a master class for a school called um, CG Cup. And that's that's available online. Um, um, I plan to make a longer course eventually. Um, you said CG Cup, CG Cup dot com yeah yeah here i'll find let me find that yeah we we basically um just talked through they, they, they did a kind of a cool thing they gave me like a randomized concept prompt that was like um um during the the, the live stream i saw the like the concept prompt for the first time. And then I had to do like a quick demo of how I would animate something according to that um, concept. Here we go. And then we did like a much longer version of it and um, did a time lapse, talked over that. So yeah, it shows a lot of the process. Um, I also have on my gum road, I have a tutorial um, along with my scripts that just shows like how to use the, the tools if you're coming out of Maya. Yeah, I shared the link uh, to your part in the C CG Cup. So oh, it's in cool. the chat for all those that uh, want to have that also bookmarked. Yeah, this is, um, let's see, this is looking. I probably want to, if I worked on this more, probably keep this a little, I think it looks better if I have more blue towards the front. So I go with that instead of, Instead of just like uniform, I'm using the C key on the keyboard to select colors and then paint again. You can get some nice gradients by, like if I paint white onto this, I get like an in-between tone and I can use C again and get like that middle tone there. Um, 
There's just some color added to that. I could probably add other colors to this, but um, it might be good to get to the next demo. You're 35 minutes in. It's cool. It's mes it's mesmerizing, right? When you're doing it, like you're just watching it. So I guess I have RGB on for the snake hook, which I often do. Um, right color selected. So that is something I often do where um, I have RGB on even for the sculpting brushes. So when I'm um, like adding form, it feels like it has like its own color. There, there are some artists who um, work with with clay who kind of do that as well. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, I guess Beth Kavaner is a really good sculptor. Um, works with with clay, I believe. And she has like like the strokes on the sculpture. You can see like have color to them. So it doesn't feel like the paint was like a second step after the fact. I really like that look. Um, like if I wanted to add more form maybe to this part, I would just clay build, build up and just have RGB on. Yeah, your technique that you're doing, you also you can think about you can do transitions, right? You know, from like a human going into were a werewolf or because you're just mm -hmm. using sub tools and you transition things through that. Yeah. Yeah, you can really um you don't have to have like the same object going through the whole thing, that's for sure. Yeah. So yeah, I just adding some sticks there. They have like some um sculpted form, but also have color on them as well. Yeah, you know, the blue that. streaks now. Yeah. yeah. Show that in the next example as well. Yeah, it actually gives a little life to it. I think you can kind of see that when it's playing through. I try to make sure I, I break things up as much as possible. The thing I don't like about CG in general and what I liked about ZBrush is that you know everything looks way too too perfect and like back when we had to do sub D modeling, like you have, you have just polygons and then you, you rely on the, the subdivision to smooth all that out and you get that really, um, kind of uniform, perfect computer look to it. And that's, you know, that's how the models used to look. And I feel like for most animation, that's still how animation looks because you know, when you're animating, you place keyframes and then you let the computer, you know, kind of automatically interpolate through those. And um, whereas if you, you know, if you sculpt in ZBrush versus sub D modeling, you can get that artistic touch on every, you know, part of the surface. And if you animate this way, you know, you can get that artistic touch on every part of the animation. So I feel like there's a good analog there. Sometimes I use um, the inflate tool with with the square alpha to get more, again more of that brush stroke look, but it's also not collapsing the surface. Like if I if I try to use um, clay buildup on something like this, it can tend to collapse the back surface. Unless I turn on back face masking, see that. So turn on this this is a really nice tool to use back face masking um, basically means that you're you're not affecting surfaces that are facing away but if i want to use sculptors pro with this um i'll have to turn off back face masking and then i'll just use um inflate so that, that works well like that so yeah, I think I'll probably switch over to the other animation. Yep. That's cool though. And seeing you build the process from ground up is giving a lot of people ideas. They're really enjoying it. So you're gonna show another project now. Um, yeah. As so if you're bringing is... stuff in to ZBrush now. Mm -hmm. So this is basically just an FVX import from Maya. I have to turn up the brightness. Okay, so these were, this was an animation in Maya. Um, 
it's just this hand and this cube. And they were, um, they come in as sub tools. And I'm just going to go through these and, and dynamesh them. So this is an example of where I want to think about like how many polygons for the entire animation I want to aim for. In this case, um, I, I think probably 100,000 ballpark per subtool works pretty well. And um, let's see, so 24, that would put me at like 2.4 million. So I'm going to go for um, 100,000. So I'm just, I just turn off sub projection most of the time. It gives me a, um, I think sub projection is made mostly like if there are areas with more detail, it will give them more polygons. Is that correct? Yeah, it's going to look and evaluate the surface. It's made also specifically for like hard surface too. So it'll put more triangles, especially on uh, sharp edges. It's like, like you took a cube. The idea behind that was to have actually keep your resolution low, but keep the model looking the same. And then we'll put triangle, more triangles where they need to be to hold mm. the surface. Okay. Yeah. If you're at, and only, it's only going to work if you, you turn project on in Dynamesh. It, if you don't have project on a Dynamesh, it does nothing. So, so yeah. So I, I do use it occasionally. I think for, again, like things like hands where I don't want it to lose. I don't, I don't want things to get merged together too much. Um, but for, all, for the sake of keeping like consistent sculpting surface where everything is the same resolution, a lot of times I leave that off um, so that everything is like, you know, all the same. Let's see, so it, it doesn't really matter what I do on these first few frames before the hand appears. But um, I have this, this uh, other Z script that I made that just copies the Dynamesh settings from the previous subtool. So basically it just pops back to the previous subtool, grabs those settings, comes back to the current one. Um, and, and then it just um, applies those to this current one. And that helps me keep the same settings consistent throughout the subtools. So there was a question about his, your, his thumbnail in the top left corner. Um, you can change that in preferences the way you can click and drag. He just looks like he picked the background color to be his document color. So there's a silhouette options in the preferences. Right, let me, I'll get the Zach Murbich for you. So then you're going through these, and this is where you're going to put your little touch of the sculpt look into this now. So yeah, so at this point, I'm I'm getting to the point where the hand is starting to come out, um, and this. So this is possibly a little too low resolution. This is at forty-seven thousand, um, but it's probably okay because this is where all of the the form is kind of combined anyway. Um, once I get to this frame, I'm probably going to want to increase resolution. So let's, see. let's put it it's around, around 100,000 there now. Um, that works pretty well. There's no, there's no clipping between these. So then I'm just going to start sculpting on these a little bit. Also, something I should add, um, if I want to adjust the animation at all, at this point, I still can. Like if I do, I do auto groups, um, it'll just separate this hand and the cube since they're they're kind of separate objects. And and I could go into um, transpose, just mask that out, and I could adjust it. If I see that that motion isn't quite right, I can adjust that. I could, you know, do, I could even adjust the fingers, whatever I want. Um, 
say that's good for now. Um, I'm going to start sculpting on this. I'm going to use the clay buildup, um, and I'm going to use RGB as well. So I'm just going to color select here with the C key, start painting there. I think I'll use Sculptors Pro. I have back face masking on. Cool thing with um, Sculptors Pro, I can use, um, it can basically blend it in just by decimating. It starts to like combine those two surfaces in, in a nice way um, that it wouldn't if it was, if it was just smoothing only. Um, to turn off RGB smoothing as well, but I just rely on that decimation. So for this one, you started in my, you were just animating just the hand in essence, the, the hand moving and opening and coming through the cube. And that's what you did. And the export of that is an FBX, right? Hmm. Yeah. No, Damon, does that answer your question for you? There was a question coming through. I'm just making sure his question is getting answered. Yeah, any questions that come up? I... Yeah. Yeah, and again, he has a script that he's got made to take his stuff out of Maya into ZBrush to give him each individual subtool. Right here, it looks like um, RGB off. I don't want to show some indication of the fingers coming through before they actually did in the Maya animation. So quickly painting that in with some, some depth as well. That looks like it's kind of starting to burst through. So the original hand here, you, you made, did you make that first in ZBrush and then sent it yeah. to my hand into your animation? Yeah. Yeah. I forgot to mention that part. Um, all my animations, you know, I, I um, create all the characters in ZBrush as well. Um, and with this, this hand is part of like a larger model I used from some of the other animations. Um, and I used a technique where I tried to basically sculpt it mostly with um, snake hook and um, like clay buildup. And for smoothing, I tried to use only trim dynamic and I get a rough look. I tried to avoid the smooth brush um, as much as I could. Yeah, the trim dynamic brush is really cool for like blocking stuff out, right? And giving that kind of, and it, it gives that kind of little sculptural look too. Um, mm -hmm. I like that brush for doing stuff like that too. So in this case, um, I want to get some drag, like some smear on these fingers to make it look like motion blur. So I'm going to use snake hook again. Um, in this case, I'm going to use back face masking and I'll grab the back of those probably turn off RGB for now. I can just do that and it will not affect the front surface of the finger at all. It'll start to get basically a motion blur look. It's especially important on um, this one because it's kind of like really far on that frame. So I would do something pretty crazy usually um, like that. And it's always just a matter of you know stepping through, making sure it actually looks right. Um, we have a specific camera in mind for this shot, so different angles. But yeah, I, I try to go pretty um, crazy with my edits sometimes. Like I'm obviously completely destroying <laughs> the fingers here, um, but when things are moving fast. Like you'd be surprised by it. it always looks better when it's extreme. I always find um, if it's moving quickly. And I tend to always save out versions. That's something I always would recommend. You know, I'd save like this and a one. Um, and I do that pretty often. And that way, if I ever destroy like one of these subtools by editing it too much and I'm not able to go back. I just go into the previous file and grab that one sub tool and you know bring it into this file and just replace that one and I can leave the rest of the animation alone that way. Um, so I think it's important to 
save versions a lot so that you have like the confidence to to break stuff worried about always losing what you did um get a result and something i also do is um snake hook with back face on and i have um different alphas like i like this one it's kind of a I need to increase the focal shift here. Fragmented look to it. Um, I also melt it look. It's making that melting look. Yeah. I also like this one. Um, it doesn't kind of pick it up as much, but it still gives some variation there. Normally I would probably take more time on this, not go quite this crazy. I think that's really good to do um, for animation, but I think for any sculpture is to, um, you have a second monitor if you can somehow get a look at it from the other monitor like right now i'm just looking at the stream actually <laughs> it's getting giving me a different different look at um how this is is playing you kind of get to the point where you have a hard time seeing what you've done on your main screen so if you have a second monitor you can um, do a few different things you can just move the interface over there um there's also a nice program called ultramon um where it lets you take like your screen and then actually flip it onto a second monitor oh. so you can see it reversed um yeah. or you can take a screenshot and just flip that that also works well um even actually if you get to the point where you have gotten quite a bit of animation i like even taking a video of my screen with my phone <laughs> and then just looking at that like somewhere else just anything to kind of, you know, get a fresh look at it. So got to get more um, feeling like it's kind of pushing the surface up. Blend these colors a little bit. So this is the block that you're actually sculpting on, right? Right now? Yeah. Yeah. So they're kind of combined at this point. And I want to get some of those colors mixed. Um, so I feel like there's some kind of inter interaction between the two objects. And you could really make this like, I feel like it's bulging out. Um, Yeah, again, for those that are just joining us, he's actually switching through subtools right now for those that are just joining us in the stream I'll open that up. to create a claymation animation style. So it's feeling like it's kind of bursting out here, but I, I think it still needs to Needs to show like some of that rippling away, you know, once it gets to this frame. So I just have to add more of that. Oh, yeah, continue that, yeah. I want it to look like it's um, propagating out ripple. And I, I do like to mix the colors from like taking some from the hand, adding a little bit here, and then color selecting again to get that in-between tone.
extreme there, but something I also do um, a lot of times is um, save a morph target for each of the sub tools. So I can go back. Um, that if only works, of course, if you, um, you know, aren't changing the, the mesh with DynaMesh or anything, but especially on like the first pass when I'm just going through, like if I'm working on these frames without any DynaMesh, then um, I like to use morph targets for that. Yeah. You could use the history brush too um, with the undo histories. Oh, cool. Yeah, I don't think I've tried that actually. Yeah, you go back to the state where the hand was good, then go back to the state where your hand now has got the sculpt and just switch the history brush and it'll start forming the mesh back to the stored and undo history point. So do I, so I click here. And, and you have to hold control and make a point on the undo. And then you would go back to where. Oh, here. Should, yeah. Oh, okay. So, then, like and that. then move your undo back to where, and now switch to the history brush. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then now just start and it'll oh, push awesome. back. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. I'll be using so, that for sure. More more fun for you to play with. Yeah. In fact, we've now made the undo history's got a bunch of features added to it. It can you can do stuff with masking, you can do stuff with polygroups, it can do this. It, we keep adding a lot of stuff that you all can do with the undo history. That actually worked perfectly in this case because um, I wanted to take it back, but not all the way. So let's see it like right there. I was trying to carve in, but it was also getting that black color. That's because alternate is on. Basically, that just means when you hold down alt, it'll go to the secondary color. So I, a lot of times I turn that off. Um, It's so cool watching you do this. My mind's just racing with some things that, you know, I want to go, you know, play with and experiment and think about this idea. It's good. I don't want to say the three magical letter words that we're all hearing often, but totally see NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've gotten a lot of I bet. people asking me about that. Um, you should, man. They, people would totally, this is awesome. It's just Awesome just to look at, like watching what you do with the animation. Oh, thank you. I mean, it is well suited for like a looping type of thing. So, yeah. Seems to be the, the craze with NFTs, the looping animation. Um, so, I'm just going to focus on the later frames. I think I haven't actually dynamesh this yet. And sometimes it's nice to to sculpt some of this before I, I dynamesh because like I could use things like um, move topological, move the hand without affecting the cube at all. Um, so there's some cool stuff you can do before dynamesh. Yeah, before you move, I want to point one thing out because I don't want to put you in the danger zone here. So you see your undoes has a red marker now. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. So this, is, this is for everybody. This is for everybody. That's telling him that there's another sub tool with a stored undo, which now he's on that one, right? You see a little gray. So if you want, you got to remember, there's a lot of stuff we're adding with undo, i.e. curves can use the undo history as well. So if you want to clear your undo, that, that stored undo, just hold control and click on the most recent undo on any sub tool you're on to make a new marker and then hold control and then do it again to clear the marker. So that, it should yeah, and then I'll do it again, and then there you go. Now there's nothing stored. Okay, just something for everybody. Since I threw that at you, and then I saw the red mark, I wanted to make sure you were aware of it, and everybody else was aware of it too. So what would happen if I used the undo history on a different sub? -tool? So what it'll do is the that brush can actually even look at other sub tools. So if you had an undo marker stored, say on sub tool five, but you're on sub tool eight, and you go to use that brush, it's going to try and go look at the mesh from sub tool five and not eight. So like okay. you can project paint and sculpt from oh, wow. one sub tool into another sub tool. Like for example, like the earthquake guy that we all got known and love, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to take his skin and his muscle and put it in his jacket, you could use this brush to do it as oh. an example. I oh. see a lot of people doing this where a lot of people will make like variation sub tools 
and then have one at the bottom and then they're just going and taking parts of every subtool to make the final piece at the bottom yeah, that's thomas cool. wittebach showed it at the summit he does it a lot for his jewelry he uses that brush a lot to do stuff like that yeah, i think that would actually work great for this um because sometimes i do take previous subtools like if i want to get like more of a smear between these i might combine these two mm -hmm. and then kind of like merge the two frames together um so yeah i could probably use that it is it is a projection brush though right so keep that in okay. mind it's using projections too that's why it doesn't matter about that's why you brought up about more targets with vertex this this undo and brush doesn't care you could have a dynamesh sculptures pro good topology bad topo it doesn't matter what the topology is mm -hmm. and any state in the undo that's the other benefit of it and that um it projects the color as well yep yeah it'll do both i'm gonna try to merge these a little bit more um again i have i think i have the square alpha probably a really low focal shift to make it really sharp see the brush stroke just merge these a little bit by inflating them and also here i think they're they're looking too separate always a you know balance between making things look cool in animation and like you know dynamic and have like flowing stuff but also not breaking the model too much like um i don't want it to look like the fingers are too fat so balance yeah, i just shared again uh, the link uh to alex's work on zebra social he's been putting the animations up for the post um, so you guys can communicate with him there as well and see all the animations he's been working on that's a tough question sean's asking how many years does it take to get this good how many so how many years have you been doing this let's go that route i can first thank you i don't <laughs> Um, so in terms of doing the ZBrush animation specifically, I guess I've done this since 2018. That's when I started playing with this. Um, I started making using ZBrush. Uh, so ZBrush, I think I got it as a present from my parents on my 18th birthday. Oh, so wow. That was, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's awesome. That's awesome. Your parents uh, got you a gift. Yeah, like this. This yeah, it was cool. It was very, that's awesome. Very nice to encourage me that way. Um, yeah, that's that's great. I think that was 2011, probably. Got it. So yeah. you've been so, yeah you've been using ZBrush for about 11 years. So that gives you a, a little range for the person who was asking the question. It's always good to see the parents like, really pushing their kids and supporting them that way. It's so cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I was um, starting out doing Lego stop motion as well. So, um, did you always... make like a YouTube or something? Are these up somewhere? Where you see the Lego stop motions or? Yeah, you... yeah. I actually made one a couple of years ago, like as an adult, um, and I still enjoy that. I, it's on my YouTube channel. Let me go. Let me get it. So people can see that as well. Is it just your name? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if that comes up. I'll find it. Yes, I got it. Here you go. Okay. I put it in the chat for everybody, his YouTube channel. So you can see the animations there as well. I also did a demo for IFCC um, where I kind of show the whole process. Oh, yeah, the that. conference in Europe uh, in, I forget where they're hosting it, Croatia? Yeah, yeah, they're in Croatia. It was it was um, 2020, so it was online only. Um, but yeah, it was a really fun event. Let me see if I can find that. Do, do they still? I'm assuming they still have it up. Yeah, I have it on my YouTube channel. Um, oh, okay. The video from right. that. Yeah, I just shared that. So you all have that in the chat now, too. Uh, I'll have 
have to try and find the IFCC one. So the conference that he was uh, speaking about, I'll put that in the chat as well. A good group. They always put on a nice, a really fun show. Very familiar. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can find yours in particular on their website. Right here, I'm I'm using um, let's see the snake hook alpha. Um, to pull the surface out, so it kind of trails behind the fingers. I want it to be only the fingers that are stretching. RGB on that. So let's see. Um, time to dynamish this one, I think. I don't want this one to stretch too much because the hand's starting to slow down at that point. I'm, uh, do you have a do you have a Twitter as well? Twitter, um, I do. It's not super active my main okay. things are instagram um and art station let me get i have like a, a link tree on my instagram that just shows all my stuff on there everything okay, let me get that then they were asking if you had one i've never had a lot of success with twitter in terms of like engagement um i know some people do I guess I probably just need to post more. I'm not a tweeter. I don't tweet myself. <laughs> I'm looking for your Instagram. It's Al uh, Alexander Lee dot art dot art. Okay. I finally uh, realized this year that you can actually change your Instagram handle because I had like my entire name with my middle name before and it was, <laughs> it was like the longest Instagram handle anyone has had. Okay. Hold on. Mm. I'm using the uh, smooth brush again with uh, a really large brush size just to uh, decimate the area where it kind of joins. So it does two things. It reduces the resolution of the subtool so it's more manageable um, in the scene. And also it um, does a good job of blending those together. Actually, probably for things like this as well, around the border here where it's like, I don't need a ton of detail, so I'll just decimate that also. There's also a way to decimate without smoothing at all. Um, I can't remember how I did that. I think I might have been poly painting with like zero RGB. Let's see if it works. You want you mean you want to reduce yeah. your polygon count? Yeah, so it's like reducing without having any other effect. Like yeah. If you turn off your Z intensity and with Sculptures Pro on, you'll just oh, okay. yeah, um, tessellating when you smooth. Yeah, that's like. That or there's tessellation too in the geometry menu. But does that affect the, like the whole unmasked yeah, you can you can unmask portions, and then it would only affect the unmasked portions. Okay, and, and then you can have a slider, and you can actually watch it tessellate and change. But what you're doing is more like interactive and artistic, 
than uh, than doing a slider. <laughs> it's more technical. I think your way is good. So um, it's also really nice for things like this. Um, you see how I had like a, a seam there. That was mostly from the rigging. When I'm doing uh, my rigging and animation, I don't worry too much about these things because I know that I'm just going to sculpt over it. So I'm just using this the smooth brush with def uh, decimation. And it just fixes that. And it, it, if I didn't have decimation on, I would tend to get like a really, uh, you don't want that. Like it just loses the form. Um, for this particular style, I don't really want it to look like that. Um, I could use smooth directional too, which I do a lot um, to kind of smooth around that crease, not affect this direction. But um, I like to use the Sculptors Pro on because then I can just use the decim decimation and keep the feeling of the same resolution while also fixing that crease. So, so I, I feel like I'd like to see more of that. Like, I feel like there's so much you can do with kind of a rough artistic style um, with Dynamesh and Sculptors Pro. So I feel like there's just a lot of potential there. Not always making everything super, you know, polished. You guys asking, do you make all the music for your animations? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I I did for that Lego one. I don't know if someone was watching that, but um, I do make music sometimes for these as well. Um, I want to do more of it. Do you draw or any other types of creative things? Yeah, yeah. I think um, drawing is probably the the most important thing for any artist. It doesn't matter what you're doing, you know, sculpting, um, animating, whatever. Um, drawing is always so important. And I um, like to do a, a lot of pen drawing. Oh, yeah, like ballpoint pen or? Well, I like brush pens now. Um, oh, okay. Like really fine brush pens, but also yeah. like felt tip is also nice. Um, I do this exercise with my girlfriend where we, we trade off um, just like drawing from imagination and just like you have to add on to what the previous person did. Um, and nice. I feel like that's really good for getting new ideas. Um, just kind of like to not necessarily try to draw something from reference, but just to you know, get some exercise making good lines and stuff like that. It's like past the drawing. Yeah. <laughs> We've talked about doing like past the sculpt where an artist starts sculpting. Oh know. yeah. There, the people have done that actually in, in the past. There's, there've been some couple artists too that one part, one person does the top and another person does them and they don't even know what the person's doing on the top or on the bottom. And then they, oh. then they bring the three pieces together to make the final piece. And it's just, it's crazy to see. Yeah, that's really goes. cool. I yeah, it's a great idea. There was, on Zebra Chancel, there was someone. There were three artists doing it. Um, I'd have to try and find it. I have done that with a group of friends too, but we we got so distracted. Um, we were having like wine and stuff, and <laughs> <laughs> it didn't, like it could have been a lot more organized. But I feel like, yeah, I feel like it's a really good exercise. Start probably just a little bit on this one, a little bit. Of, indication of motion, but it's it's not moving much at this point. Do you always work in like this tone of colors? I noticed a lot of your animations have this this same tone of grayscale. Do you do any other things painting wise, like fluorescent, bright colors? Or are you mostly staying in this? Well, yeah, I'd like to. Like, I think I should do more colors. It's um, it's more like a comfort zone, I guess, having these drab colors. Um, but yeah, I think you could do some. I have done one animation, the one I did for CG Cub where it was like a lot more colorful. It was still kind of pastel, but it were a lot of um, 
primary colors and stuff. Um, I think that would be cool to do that more. So I'm using a move topological here just to, I saw that these streaks are not really following the path exactly of the, the motion. So I'm just using that to move them a little bit. And that way it won't affect what's behind it. Again, the focal shift, if I make it really focused, it's really good for stuff like this. Yeah, it looks like this um, part here, it's kind of detaching from the surface, but then it combined more. Um, looks like it's just kind of goes back to normal way too fast. So I'm gonna that. We use RGB again. Usually I like to, rather than doing a brush a bunch of different strokes like that, it's good to try to do it all together. Um, let's see. I'm getting the distance that I want. So I think it's because my side size needs to be smaller. Yeah, I just get a better shape a lot of times when I'm doing this, but just do it all in one stroke. Um, I have a quick save. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was trying to um, use like a really big brush with decimate right then. Let's see, should be that there, right? Yep. So let's see, yeah, so I have the forgot to show the material I was using. It's um let's see. So it's this material I made um for painting. And it, it's very similar to the color you would see if you just had like um a flat color, just had some shading on it. Um there's also this guy, Zebro. He makes some good materials. He has a paint material, it's pretty similar. On my material, I just reduced the specular a little bit. Yeah. So you can check out uh, Zebro's mat caps, pretty good. So let's see, yeah, it looks like that's where I was. Yeah, I think I need to smooth that back a little bit. Um, And then once it gets to this point um, where it's not moving, um, there's a few different things you can do. A lot of times I try to keep the model look pretty intact, but to keep like a sense of motion, um, I will go through and kind of um, use Sculptors Pro to kind of go over the surface and change the resolution on each frame. Um, Cause I just don't want it to ever look like, you know, polygons, like you can see that same polygon is, uh, it's just, sitting there. <laughs> I'd rather make it look like the surface is alive. Um, that's probably the last step of this. It's just going through the rest of those. 
Yeah, everything in motion. Yeah. Turn up the Just light then, a little time bit. check for you. You're an hour and 20 in. Okay. Yeah, I should be wrapping this up pretty soon. Yeah, there's a, so many fun things you can do with this workflow that you're showing us. Yeah, I would like to try more stuff like you were talking about with um, morphing between two character scopes, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, you can technically even do something like that with the timeline, too, because you can swap out subtools even on the timeline itself as well. But this, right. is, yeah. this is even better because you're just, you're just playing from one subtool to another subtool. I have used the timeline with subtools um, occasionally where I want to have, like, I take camera animation from Maya and then I imported it into ZBrush. And it was kind of like a complicated process for um, the Z script that I made for that. But you can get um, basically so the, the camera was keyframed on the timeline in ZBrush and the subtools. And then if you uh -huh. step through, it's actually like flying through. Yeah. Um, This way is just more freedom, right? Because every every subtool can have its own geometry. Every subtool can be whatever it wants. So there's just a lot of freedom here for you. You can convert to one that has now clean topology, and it's just a different subtool in your animation. It's a very cool workflow. So yeah, I'm just going to go through this quickly, and um, first I'll just dynamesh each of these. I'm using a copy previous. all the frames. Um, and then I'll just fix this transition here. Also, um, for anyone not using right click navigation, this is a uh, very helpful. This would be a lot slower without that. Join the army, right click army. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, I prefer it. That's why I always make the jokes about the right click army. I actually um, found out about it from the ZBrush Summit. I think it was 2019 when you were talking about it. I was like, wow, I didn't know about it. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah there's, actually, there's four ways to navigate now in ZBrush, technically. Oh, really? Yeah. Because you have the original, you have the right click. Now you could get the 3D mouse too. That will navigate. Oh, okay. And there's actually a, a way to just gesture to. Uh, navigate as well. Um, with but the no one cursor? Uses, no one, I haven't seen anybody use the gesture one. Yeah, how does that work? You have to turn it on. It's off by default. And use it. You got to hold the shift key. So like a circling will zoom and frame out. And then just moving your hand back and forth will zoom in and turn the model at the same time for you. Oh, wow. And focus on that area where as your hand's just moving back and forth. If it's less back and forth, then it zooms in closer. If it's larger back and forth, it doesn't zoom in as much. And the direction that you're doing that movement will also shift, turn the model. Wow. Because, <laughs> you know, you... some people like the sculpt, you know, some people might prefer sculpting vertically, some people prefer sculpting horizontally. So you're talking about with the cursor or are you talking about like with a webcam? No, no, with the cursor. Okay. <laughs> yeah, with the cursor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. This, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering, like computer yeah. vision. No, 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 with the, with the cursor. So you can see that once I dynameshed all of those, there is still a little bit of motion in the surface throughout. Um, so if I played this back full speed, it's it's a little too fast. So I'm just stepping through by tapping, um, and then you know once I would render this, I would I would um, set up the timing on that. Um, basically, make some frames take longer than others. Um, This is, is a little uh, ugly the way I did this. I would probably usually take more time to just make sure these curves follow um, the, the motion exactly. And if I turn off solo, you can see that, which looks kind of cool. Um, it also would help me, you know, that's exactly where something that's good to do when you're, like, if I'm working on it this way, you can just hold down Alt and tap a subtool to switch to it. 
Oh, so that's what I'm doing there. You can also uh, press N and select them here. Oh, yeah, the list. Yeah, it's a great way to line them up for you. Keep that line going through the animation. Animation was not my strong suit. That's why I switched to modeling. It's <laughs> cool. So yeah, it's probably pretty good for a demonstration. I yeah, there'd be a lot more that I would do to this, but. Okay, does anybody have any other questions for Alex while we still have him with us in the stream? To go ahead and put them in the chat and I will try and funnel them to him as we've been going along here. I can say that they've really enjoyed it. You've inspired a lot of people. I know a lot of people in the chat were saying they were inspired watching and oh, good. seeing a different way of doing this and different techniques. So. Um, which is part of the reason why we're doing these streams too, is get other yeah. artists like yourself out there, see what stuff you're doing and see yeah, other ways of using that. ZBrush. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. It's our pleasure, man. Like, thank you for taking time out of your day to be with us, to share your techniques and your workflow. It's, it definitely sucks you in what you're doing, right? It, it just memorizes me to like, you just watch what happens as you're moving along in the, the animation. Yeah, I feel like it's um it's really fun just to feel like um you know like you have an, another dimension to your sculpt. It's what it feels like. Like yeah. you can rotate around in three D, but you can also go through in in time. So it it does feel like a lot like just sculpting in ZBrush like normal, but it just has that another dimension to it. Um, so Magdalena was asking, how does he go about exporting the animations? Does he just export all sub tools and combine them, or screen capture? So if you want to touch base on that again, what you do? Um, yeah, so I I, um, I just export here. Um, let's see. Just use S FBX. And I, I do all sub tools. Um, and I make sure that these are all, see they're named um, out 0, 12. So like zero zero one through however many, um, and I export them all, and then I turn off smooth normals. That's about it. Um, yeah, and the maps are also on by default, so you've turned off the maps and turned. Yeah, off I, I don't normal. need any of that because all of the, it's all poly paint, um, and that'll just go through and export those all together to one file, and then I um, use my script in Maya to automatically import um that fbx and split it up and and keyframe those so that they're visible throughout the animation so right. it'd be a, a little a little hard without a script to you could still do it for sure but you just would have to go through and you know you know show hide them individually Do you do any easing in and out later and additional animation or this is it? Yeah, that's a good question because I, I do do that. Um, like this part is supposed to be really fast. So I'd probably have this on 15 frames per second. This would be one sculpt per frame just straight through. But then once it gets to this point, I might have like this would be held for two frames. This would be held for two frames. This would be, probably be held for three frames actually. And that kind of helps get that, um, you know, that stop motion look as well, animating on twos or threes, something that they do a lot with hand-drawn animation. You know, usually when something's moving slowly, you don't need very many drawings. When it's moving really fast, you want it to be on every single frame. So that's that's the general principle there. And I just play it back in, in Maya and um, get a sense of, you know, what needs to be sped up or slowed down.
and then you do screen captures you said sometimes just right out of zbrush oh uh, yeah yeah um sometimes i like the look that it has with just with the, the zbrush seder but before a full render I, I i do it in maya i have done it in unity as well um i have like another technique for that um but that's that was a whole <laughs> separate process getting it to run in real time Oh yeah. All right. This has been really great. Are there any other questions for Alex before we uh, finish off the stream here? So it looks like I think we got them all as we were moving along there. Uh, Alex, this has been really, really fun, man. Thank you for taking time out of your day to do this. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks so really much. Really appreciate it. Um, Again, I'm going to share some of your work so people have it again, um, can see. So this is his uh, ZBrush Central post. So you guys can obviously communicate with him here too as well. He's got a lot of his animations in here. Uh, I'll put this in the chat again so you have it. Um, so you can come here. But he's also got his art station um, and his Instagram that we shared in the chat as well. Um, so we can share those in here too. So here, I'll grab them again. So you guys can have those. I'll put them in now. So they're towards the bottom of our conversations that we're having here. So thanks, Alice. This has been yeah. really, really awesome. A lot of fun. Um, really cool to see your process and see how you're making this. And I, I'm, I'm on board with everybody. It's very inspiring, actually, just sit and watch. Oh, great. Your so yeah, this was super fun. I like um, talking to people about it and hearing other ideas and also right. those other techniques for. Uh, undo history i'm definitely gonna yeah <laughs> something, else to play some with. With. something else to play with yeah right and then i want to iterate like you know um alex is our third episode of doing these streams again we're having all now i think we're pretty much booked every single week we're going to be having streams so i encourage you all to check out our calendar um in here so i'll put this in here to see when the streams are like people like alex joining us to show their processes and see how they're using zbrush um again next week alone we have three streams next week alone um that are and what i mean by that i mean by us the company and us the people here at the zbrush family um so we have a maxon uh meeting coming up on 8 a.m april 20th but then we're going to do another one um you can come and listen to my bad jokes at 11 a.m on that same day which is next wednesday and then we have another exciting one something like with alex um we're having the team from huxley so ben moreau and sava and Antonio, they're going to be showing, I'm sure some of you probably watched this trailer. They're going to join us for a stream next Thursday, and they're going to break down how they were using ZBrush and even Redshift to render out Huxley. So um, this would be a great place then for you guys to see more streams like what we're doing here with Alex, just so you have that information. So I'll uh, put that down. So Alex, I can't thank you enough for being a part of this. And, Episode three officially of the ZBrush Image, uh, ZBrush Central Image Breakdown. Yeah, thanks so much. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. So um, thank you all again for tuning in. Please keep coming by and watching these streams. We love to uh, see what artists are doing with ZBrush and getting that out there and getting people to learn who Alexander is and seeing his work. And it's just a lot of fun to be able to sit with you guys in the community and uh, have a conversation and see what you're all doing. So. Thanks again, Alex. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yep. So once again, I'm Paul Gabriel with uh, ZBrush Live. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And hopefully I see you at the next stream. Bye. See you guys. See you later.